Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. So train derailments happen far too often than we even know. I mean just this year alone there has been more than 1000 derailments which is more than 3 derailments per day and that's in the US alone. So it's not really a matter of if another derailment will happen but more a matter of when another derailment will happen. So in this video we'll look at different causes of derailment but specifically we will look at this simple ratio also called Nadal ratio. Some sometimes also referred to as LV ratio or derailment ratio or YQ ratio and we'll see how this simple ratio holds the key to preventing another disaster. Interestingly enough, as I'm making this video today, there has already been two derailments. One happened in Ottawa in Kansas and one happened in Big Lake, Minnesota. So they happen way more often than we even realize. Now sometimes derailments look a lot simple. Train derails from the track, the train still stays upright, everyone escapes unharmed and there are some minor disruptions for a few hour or maybe a one day and then everything is back to business. But sometimes derailments can look a lot worse. There's few weeks to months of disruption. People can also be harmed and the biggest of all there can be hazardous material that escapes into the environment that can leave everlasting damages to the environment. Let's see why these derailments happen. Well for the trains to run safely on tracks the two running rails or the two tracks have to be at a certain distance, not any more than that or not any less than that. If the distance increases, then what happens is that your wheel will drop, your train will derail. Now, one of the causes is that the track quality could just be poor, just poor build quality, poor design. Another popular reason is that in extreme heat or in hot temperatures, your rail, like any other material, wants to expand. But if there is not enough room given for the rail to expand, then buckling happens which looks something like this and when buckling happens it causes gauge widening and then your train derails. Another factor is broken rail. Now this is quite self-explanatory. I don't think I need to explain this but yeah if your train goes over this section or this section then your train is guaranteed to derail. So broken rail is also another one of the popular reasons and that's why there are regular track inspections conducted. There's one more very interesting reason why trains derailed and that is intentional. We have something called catch points or trap points on the rail. Basically what these points do is that if a train starts rolling or if a train has a brake failure or if it starts doing unauthorized movement then these catch points are set away such that passenger movement or the mainline movement is protected. Then there are miscellaneous reasons, poor track bed, environmental disasters, fallen rocks, fallen trees on the track or your wheel is broken. So things like that can cause the trains to derail. But the one we are most interested in today is called flange climb. So first of all, this is called a flange. And what happens with flange climb is that when lateral forces develop and exceed safe limits, then your flange literally climbs the rail and then jumps and then the train derails. Here, your flange has climbed the rail. And when your flange climbs the rail, the other wheel drops and then your train derails. Let's look at one of the examples. So in Melbourne, in Victoria, a train derailed and on the investigation by ATSB, which is Australian Transport Safety Board, what they found was that the derailment was due to increase in the wheel to rail lateral force. So whenever investigators investigate, basically what they're looking for are marks on the rail which show whether wheel climbed the rail or not. And in this scenario, you can see the wear marks on the rail which shows that the wheel climbed the rail and that's what they have written in their findings. Now, what are the origins of these lateral forces? Well, one of the reasons is that the train wheels are not perfectly cylindrical but rather conical. One of the reasons for conical wheels is, is that it makes it easier for the wheels to go around curves. Another reason for them to be conical is to have a self-centered motion. So if a train starts going away from the center then the conical wheel brings them back to the center. Same way if a train starts going in the other direction the conical wheels bring it back to the center. Because of this there is a constant sinusoidal motion in which a train is running. You can also see it here 
that your train is not in the perfect center and it is actually moving slightly from left to right. One of the reasons why as passengers we don't really feel it is because there are something called yaw dampers which are dampening the movement from left to right. Another reason are lateral forces because of curves. If you ever dr drive a car or if you've ever been in a car and your car takes a sharp curve, you will feel an outward force pushing you out. And same thing happens with the train as well. Anytime the train is going on a curve, there's an outward force pushing it out and the same outward force is also felt by the wheel and that's another reason why wheels experience increased lateral forces. Uh, there's actually a movie called Unstoppable which actually perfectly portrays this. A speeding train is going over a curve at speeds higher than safe speeds and you can see that the lateral forces have built so much that the inner wheel literally lifts off of the track and stuff falls off of the train. So this picture quite accurately portrays increased lateral forces that a wheel experiences when it goes over a curve. So at this point, I want to show you what these extra pieces of rails are. So what these extra pieces of rails are, are actually called guardrails. And the purpose of these guardrails is that when a train is going over a curve and the outer wheel is experiencing excessive lateral forces, then the inner wheel engages with this guardrail and this guardrail is able to stop or restrain the wheel. And this restraining makes sure that the lateral force on the outer wheel do not exceed the safe limits. So that's why we have these guardrails. They come in different shapes and sizes. Some of them look exactly like the running rail and some of them look differently. I also want to mention that there are these other sets of guardrails that you'll see. The purpose of these guardrails are actually different from this. The purpose of the inner guardrail is to prevent the train from derailing. And the purpose of these guardrails is that if your train has derailed, regardless of all the precautions that we took, and if it has still derailed, then this other rail is able to stop the train from falling off into the river or falling off of a cliff and for it to become way more catastrophic. Now I've kept mentioning that there are these safe limits or exceeding these limits. So is there a way to determine those limits? Actually yes, those limits are referred to as the LV ratio. Now this LV ratio was first devised by this gentleman called Francois Joseph Nadal in the year 1896. In his paper Theory of Stability of Locomotives, the paper was written in French while he was a mining engineer. So this is how the formula looks. It's not too complicated because we are just going to derive this. But for now, looking at this formula, L basically means the lateral force that we've been talking about. V is the vertical force, or you can also say the weight of the train. Then this is the angle between the wheel and the rail. And then mu is the coefficient of friction, which characterizes how rough or smooth two surfaces are. And we'll just derive it now. So this is the cross section of a wheel on a rail, the very first force that we want to look at are the vertical forces which the wheel exerts on the rail. You can also say it is due to the weight of the train. Then the second one is the force that we have been speaking about. It's the lateral force which is due to the sinusoidal motion or due to the curving of the train which is pushing the wheel outwards. Now when a wheel is in contact with the rail, it is not a horizontal plane but actually it is at a certain angle and that angle is theta. And the force with which the wheel is constantly trying to climb the rail, let's call it F2. If you look at video here, basically the wheel is constantly trying to climb the rail. It's kind of like a person climbing a steep hill. And sometimes when the friction is very low, meaning the surface is smooth and slippery, that no matter how hard you try, you keep slipping back. Sometimes the friction is high and with enough forces, you are able to climb the steep hill. This is just an analogy of how friction will also affect if the wheel is able to climb the rail or not. Let's look a bit more into friction. The way friction works is that frictional force FF is the product of the perpendicular or normal force which we can call V but the product of perpendicular force and the product of coefficient of friction is the frictional force. Coefficient of friction is what characterizes how rough or smooth two surfaces are. So for example, steel on steel has a coefficient of friction of 0.74. Teflon, so you would have heard of the non-sticky Teflon kitchen utensils. Teflon has a very low coefficient of friction. That's why it is non-sticky. Then there's ice. Ice also has very low coefficient of friction. The bottom line is coefficient of friction characterizes how smooth and rough 
of the surfaces are and frictional force is the product of perpendicular normal force and coefficient of friction. But in our scenario, it's not a perfectly horizontal plane. It's actually on a certain angle. So because of the angle, let's try to determine what these normal perpendicular force is. F3 is the normal perpendicular force and it will be equal to the weight of the train adjusted by a certain angle, V cos theta, the lateral force adjusted by a certain angle, so L sine theta, that would be the perpendicular force. Similarly, if we look at the other axis, which is the axis on which the train is trying to climb the rail, and if we try to equate all the forces on the axis, your F2 plus the lateral force component, which is L cos theta, will be equal to V sine theta. So that's the equation of forces on this axis. And the frictional force in this scenario would be equal to the product of perpendicular or normal force and the coefficient of friction. So for your wheel to be able to climb the rail, F2 should be equal to or higher than coefficient of friction times perpendicular force. If you substitute all of these, you will be able to derive this formula. So now that is the Nadal formula or Nadal ratio, also called L over V ratio, also called y over q ratio, also called derailment ratio. That's what it looks like. But to extract some interesting conclusions, let's plot this equation on a graph. This is the LV value. This is the contact angle, which is this theta. Mu is the coefficient of friction. So this gives us a bit more understanding, but let's try to compare a couple of scenarios to understand how these LV ratios work. So one scenario is high coefficient of friction, meaning the surfaces are rough. And the other scenario is low coefficient of friction, meaning the surfaces are smooth. So for a high coefficient of friction, it's rough rails and then rough wheels and old and rusty and dry. Whereas the low coefficient of friction, 0.1, are properly lubricated rails and then properly lubricated flanges. So what this means is that for high coefficient of friction, the Nadal ratio is close to 0.4. That means that in order for your train to stay on tracks and not derail, your lateral force can only be 0.4 times or 40% of the vertical force. Now for the same train, for the same weight, if the rails are lubricated and if the wheels are lubricated, then your lateral force can now be 160% times the vertical force and your train will still be fine. So that's one example of how L over V ratio affects and that's also one of the reasons why wheels and rails are lubricated. So going back to that derailment in Australia, you can also see that the ATSB found the main factors contributing to the derailment were the high coefficient of friction between the wheel and rail. So clearly coefficient of friction matters a lot. On the next one, let's look at the same two wheels. So we have the same train and this, those two trains have same coefficients of friction. So we're still looking at 1.0 coefficient of friction line. But this time, we're looking at two different flange angles. So one flange angle is 75 degree, the other flange angle is 63 degree. And what we can see is that for the 63 degree flange angle, your lateral force can only be 40% of the vertical force and you'll be fine. But for a more steeper flange angle, which is 75 degree, your lateral force can be now 60% of the vertical force instead of 40. It can now be 60 and your train will still be fine. So what that means is that if you keep increasing the flange angle, you will be able to not derail at even higher and higher percentages of vertical force. So that's another way of interpreting this graph. You must be thinking the wheels must be standard, right? I would say they sort of are, but they sort of are not. And this data that I got from the internet shows exactly that. You can see that flange angles from different agencies in US for different trains are all over the place. So it ranges all the way from 60 degrees to on the higher side, 75 degrees. So flange angles can be different. Another really important one that I want to explain to you is on a high quality track, which is straight, which is flat without any deformities, the LV ratio throughout the run remains more or less consistent. So the LV ratio will stay at a certain level. But if your rail is of poor quality and has has something like this, which we also call cyclical top, then in that scenario, your LV ratio sort of keeps going up and down. At certain point, you have a higher vertical force, but when your rail dips, the vertical force becomes really low because now your wheel unloads. If I were to explain it to you, if you're ever going in a car and there's a big pothole, 
for a second you feel weightless and that's basically your car and your wheels have unloaded so when it unloads vertical force drops below a certain value because of which now your denominator is low and so your numerator is the same and so your lv ratio will be very high and cause derailments that's why when we build tracks there are limits to how much track twist is allowed for safe operation of the train i hope the video has been informative let me know if you enjoyed it or not and let me know in the comments what do you think what are the next topics that you want to see and i'll see you in the next one thank you